prior to Father's Day, or as it is a custom that we have here in the parish for Father's Day, that we have a triduum of masses, three masses that are said for the intentions of those whose names have been either get and sent in, either they are fathers here in the parish or, or fathers of other members of the parish who are here, or those who are deceased, whatever intentions may have been sent in, we remember them in that course of those three masses. And it's something that we can try to do in, in several different ways. One, it's a gift of love from those who wish to have their loved ones remembered in this way, because it's a special gift that can be given for Father's Day that um, they're remembered by masses, especially in the, in the mass, three masses that can be offered for this intention. But also it's just something that, that I, as the parish priest here, am glad to be able to do for the fathers and men who will be fathers here in the parish um, as a way of just expressing my prayers for you by three times, and that way offering prayers for you and for your intentions um, for the graces that you need, because it is a difficult task in our time, I'm sure, to be a good Christian father. St. Paul reminds us that the pattern for all Christian fatherhood is based on God the Father. He says, for whom all paternity in heaven on earth is named after God the Father himself. So since all fatherhood is based or follows the pattern of Almighty God, our own Heavenly Father, we see that there are many virtues um, that our fathers themselves are called themselves to practice. Mercy, love, care, compassion justice and all these various things, all those qualities that belong to Almighty God himself, we want to see reflected in good Christian fathers, again, because that is the pattern that is sent before us. So again, that's part of my intentions as I pray these Masses, for the, the, the Masses that are here for these Triduum Masses for Father's Day, is for that, first of all, that to be able to find in that paternity of God, the fatherhood of God, as St. Paul calls it the graces that are needed by good Christian fathers to live according to the pattern that God wishes them to have. Secondly, though, as I also pray these Masses, I also try to look ahead to the Sunday, Father's Day itself. Look to the Epistle and Gospel for today. If you've often heard me say, I'm not one who just happens to look at things by a luck of the draw. We just happen to have on this day, oh, by luck or some serendipity or good fortune or whatever you want to call it, um, that it just happens to be that today is the Epistle and Gospel. I'm a firm believer in the um, providence of God and the way God works with the providence of men. Because of that, in that firm believer of this, looking to that, we see that because Easter was a little earlier this year, and so Father's Day is a little bit later in the time after Pentecost than it usually is, we have an Epistle and Gospel set before us that have important virtues, I think, to be able to help us stand out for good Christian fathers themselves. And if we can summarize all of the different things that come before us in the Epistle and Gospel today, both what St. Peter himself outlines and then what St. Then what Matthew gives to us from the Sermon on the Mount, I think if we could summarize this whole thought or all the thoughts that come from that, we can summarize it as a point of being a peacemaker, the idea of what the Gospel is. That God wants good Christian fathers, good Christian men, to be men, people who seek after peace, to use St. Peter's language, to seek after peace and to pursue it, to actually go after it, to know that peace, peace of heart, peace of soul, not only personally, but in every kind of relationship, every kind of dealing with our fellow men, needs to be something that is established and well-established in our own hearts and whatever influence can be given toward others. This notion here of being working for being a peacemaker, as the Beatitudes tells us, is something that God holds high. He tells us that those who are actually peacemakers, they are the ones who are going to have a possession of the land, so to speak. And it's not just material benefits, but God's great blessing will be upon them because they are seeking after the very quality him God himself wishes among men, and that is peace. So what I'd like to do today, come, you know, looking at those particular points, the fatherhood of God as a pattern for good Christian fathers, the spirit of peace, this you know, notion of peace that comes up from the epistle and gospel story of today. Looking at all these particular things now, uh, there's one virtue I'd like to hold out for Christian fathers today that is an important virtue, and yet it's going to be looked on if we take it in light of how society looks at the virtues that men have, they're almost going to laugh at it as a, as a consideration 
for men, a virtue that men should possess. This virtue was the virtue of meekness. Depending on what you think, how you consider what meekness is, a meekness of spirit, depending on how you look upon it, is going to be the way you consider that this is going to be the right consideration or a good consideration for Father's Day to present to good Christian fathers as a virtue to strive for. I dare say when we start talking about this whole idea of virtue, I found personally as a priest that it's one of those virtues that just hard to describe in just one sentence or one idea. Again, because many people have their own concept toward meekness. I think when they think of meekness, they think of this mousy individual who is just all quiet, all shy, who gets shoved and pushed around, can't speak up, can't stand up for himself, is being persecuted, has all these different um, problems that happen to him, and he does very little to assist him in himself. If that's what you think meekness is, you're completely wrong as far as the virtue goes. That's how the world considers the notion of meek. They look on it upon of cowardice. They seem to something that's a weakness in any particular way. But meekness as a virtue, meekness as a Christian virtue, it actually is a manly virtue because it's going to take men to be able to practice it well. Meekness as a virtue, as presented to us by Jesus Christ himself. Remember in the gospel story, he tells us, learn of me because I am meek and humble of heart. He wants us to learn lessons from him, especially he's signaling out to us the meekness that we find in the imitation found from his sacred heart. And he says, if you imitate this meekness, he says, you will have rest for your souls. You will be at peace. You will be peacemakers. Again, back to this pattern of the paternity of God. Meekness as a virtue, like I said, it's a complex virtue. There's several different things that make it up and then when combined together, we see that regardless what other people think of it, it is something that demands courage, it demands strength to practice it well. So that when meekness is held out to us as a virtue to practice, it really means that anyone who is truly meek after the pattern of the heart of Jesus Christ, who follows the image of Christ in the gospel stories, really truly is a man. Because who amongst us here would say that Christ is no man? Christ is a wimp. Christ is a coward. He is meek because he cowers around and is beaten up by other people. Not at all. If you say that, you have no concept. It's near blasphemy to consider that idea. The first idea, the first concept we look here, the, the, this complex virtue of meekness, is that it demands that, that we have a self-control a self-mastery, actually, that we have advanced so much in our practice of the love of God, our practice of Christianity, that I have learned to keep my passions in check, especially the passion of anger, especially that one. So contrary is anger to meekness. It's as contrary to the man, the, that, those to the virtue of meekness and anger, just as would anger unjust anger be found in the heart of Jesus Christ himself. This self-mastery, this means that I have become strong enough that when some things come along that want to push my button, I don't let that button get pushed. That when people come and say some things to me or about me, I don't react like the people of the world would do. That say that we must react in anger firing back at people, letting them know I've been hurt, letting them know what's on my mind, letting them know that I must be angry because it's the right way to do. I will not be pushed over. Understand this. Someone who is truly Christian and meek is not a pushover. They have mastery. They have self-control. Even when being persecuted, they can have such a self-possession about them, they do not need to use angry words to combat against the evils of those against them. No, rather it is those who are super weak, who are really wimps, who do not understand what the virtue of meekness is. They are the ones that when it comes to the point of people say something against them, they fly off the handle. They're not meek at all. There's no possession of virtue there. 
They have not gained the first element that is necessary here, self-control, self-mastery. Again, self-mastery is a proof that I really am living the Christian virtue, that I am making progress in my spiritual life, that I really am a child of God for men, for fathers, that I really live, am living after that pattern of God himself. It's an open proof of that, self-mastery. Losing myself, it just proves I'm not making the effort to live for God as I should. Another element of this virtue of meekness is a tolerance of the failings of others. We don't sit in judgment over the failings of other people. God knows we have enough of our own. God knows we want other people to be patient with our faults and failings. God knows that because we complain about it enough. So why is it then that when I find somebody else around me who may do something that I just don't like, that just bothers me in some particular way, I fly off the handle at them. I show them by words, by deeds, by looks that I have. I can't tolerate you. I don't want you around me. This notion of meekness, a tolerance for the failings of others, it demands patience, which again is such a manly virtue of itself. Patience really practiced well. The spirit of tolerance here for their failings. Our, our best attitude toward it is that we learn to pray for people rather than yell at them or talk about them for their faults and failings. And even as St. Paul says, even if I should catch my neighbor in sin, you who are spiritual must handle it in a spiritual way. And being intolerant of such people is not a spiritual way. And yet people still continue to do it. They can hear such thoughts like this. They can understand. Maybe they can even explain charity to other people, patience toward other people. And yet let them be struck with someone who just happens to say something that they don't like. And boom, they fly off the handle and think that's virtue, thinks that's the right way to work and to handle as a Christian. It is not. And it especially not to be those who are numbered among the meek to handle that, to be in that way. A third element of the virtue of meekness is the forgiveness of injuries. To use the scripture language here, forgiveness of injuries from the heart. That means I don't keep thinking about it. That means I don't go drug it, digging it back up, opening the wound, sitting around some table at night, talking to friends and neighbors or whatever, getting on an internet blog, calling somebody else, you know what this person did to hurt me, and coming into all kinds of judgments against such people all because I cannot forgive injuries done to me. Oh yes, if I happen to injure somebody, I'm the first one to expect other people to forgive me, to expect it. But turn it around. Now, you injure me, you're going to feel it. Meekness means I have a benevolence towards all. Benevolence. It's a loving kindness. It's a mildness. It's a gentleness towards all, even my enemies. You know, this is more than just a counsel in the gospel. I dare say it's a command. When Jesus says that if someone should strike you on the cheek, you're to let go the other and let him strike him on that side. You're supposed to. How many people here will do that? No, he doesn't mean that. No, I, I'm not going to get walked over by other people. That's not how men act. Are you Christian? Are you meek? Do you understand what it means to imitate Jesus Christ and to follow what he has taught? I don't think so. If you have never learned the lesson of turning the other cheek, 
if you've never practiced it. You haven't learned anything of the Christian spirit yet. And speaking to fathers and to men today, you haven't learned to be men. It is not manly to fly off the handle. It is not manly to strike back at other people. It is manly to practice virtue, to live as a Christian. That's where true men are to be found. This is why I said before, meekness, when it's really understood, meekness is a virtue that demands, demands a lot of effort to practice. It demands, it's a true manly virtue. I'm not leaving men and women, or women and children, you know, out of this too, because everyone needs to practice meekness, but this is Father's Day. So we're addressing men in particular here. But meekness, meekness in this spirit, meekness in this whole idea. Yes, it might be difficult, but isn't that where the reward for virtue comes from? Is doing the hard for the love of God because we know this is what God wants us to do? Is it not? Why is it that we run away so quickly from the things of God simply because it is too hard? Ah, there's the cowardice. There's that weakness that the world is saying, calling people who are meek. But for the interior man, the Christian man, meekness is an interior virtue. It's, it's less about how I act externally. There are so many people out there, you've probably met them themselves, seem to be calm of nature, very quiet. Seemingly, they're the definition of meekness. And yet, touch them? <laughs> the fly off the handle. They will let you know that they are angry. Huh. We've just found out that person isn't meek at all. Under that guise of gentleness, under that guise of likableness, is hidden a nest of vipers in the soul that has so choked out the love of God to the point this person is far from being meek, far from imitating that great virtue of the heart of Jesus Christ. Now, meekness is not so much in the exterior as it is in the interior. And one thing about meekness as a virtue, um, it's unique of the virtues in this sense. Meekness is practiced both in the will and in the emotions. Most of the time, virtues are in the will, keeping the emotions in check. But in this particular case, meekness is not only in the will, saying, I will be this peacemaker and live for God as I should, but in the emotions, letting peace reign on the inside by words and gestures that I do that are genuine before God, that they are constant no matter what the circumstance comes up, no matter what trial to this virtue may happen, I am acting consistently the same way all the time. This is why I say meekness demands effort, demands strength, far more than the world could ever guess. Jesus holds himself up as an example of meekness, as I've already said. Let's take a look at some of the things in the gospel so we can understand why it is that Jesus Christ is our perfect example of meekness of spirit. How you and I, if we need a model for meekness, we will find it in him. First of all, let's look at the way that Jesus preaches the gospel. Gospel means peace. And he pe preaches it in a peaceful manner. There's no spirit of bitterness about him, no animosity toward other people. Even the words that we read in the gospel story of today, when he says to others that unless your justice abound more than the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. There was no bitterness there in his words, no animosity toward it. It's a statement of fact toward those who are saying, the Pharisees and the scribes are not the ones to imitate in virtue. What I am to preach to you here is what you must imitate. There was a calmness about him, a serenity, in his countenance, his speech was something that attracted people. 
that virtue of meekness of him showed not only the words were important, but by deeds it attracted people to this way of living. Another thing we see in the life of Jesus Christ and his acting in a meekness of way, something for us to um, imitate is in his choice of the apostles. You know, I dare say, if you look, if you take a look at the life of the apostles themselves, Peter, Andrew, James, John, all the ones, the ones that Jesus had called to him, if you were a practical CEO of a company, you did the worst thing in choosing those men for the job that was set before them. Look for the duty that was set before them to go forth and to preach the gospel to every creature, to establish the church by which all men will be saved. These men were rough. For the most part, four of them anyway were fishermen. One was a tax collector. Others had their own temperaments, and we see them come up in the gospel stories. And yet, all the way through, Christ chose each one of these men, despite their roughness, their ignorance, despite all of these things, the faults and failings they had, the rudeness of character they even showed toward Jesus himself, he chose them because God will use weak things to confound the strong. But it's the infinite patience of Jesus with these rough, ignorant men whose faults and failings come out quite strongly at times who need great instruction, who at times are so forgetful of all the things that they have learned. It's, it's that one gospel story where Jesus is about to send into heaven. It's only minutes away. They're on the walk, the pathway toward the mountain, the Mount of Olives, where he will ascend into heaven. And as they get closer along the way, one of them, it's Philip, turns to Jesus and says, Will thou now at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You almost imagine... That at that point, Jesus did one of these head slaps. Philip, how long have I been among you and you have not heard me? Just, even at this hour, after his proof of the resurrection from the dead, and they're still asking things that have nothing to do with the kingdom of God that they're going out to spread. The infinite patience of Jesus Christ with these men, the infinite patience of Jesus Christ with us. Gosh, there's meekness personified. In Jesus, we see someone who readily forgives sinners, even the most guilty, as long as there is some show of repentance. Jesus does not hold a grudge toward other people doesn't harbor things in his heart. Keep bringing it back up over and over and over again. But right away shows forgiveness and mercy, even to the point of dying for them. Boy, what virtue, what strength, what meekness. My prayer for fathers and the men today, especially those we're remembering now in the Triduum of Masses, is first of all, in this practice of meekness, understanding the importance of the practice of meekness, that first of all, that you will do all you can to avoid quarrels, harsh and hurtful words. Do not frighten away the timid souls. And you know you've met them. They come up in your life, work, school, whatever it might be. Do not frighten them away. Jesus would not have done that. Do not render evil for evil. Isn't that what St. Peter tells us today? Do not speak in some angry mood, but rather, if I find myself in a point of anger, I learn to calm down long before I speak and don't just fly off in a rage and anger and then afterwards say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Practice self-mastery. Practice self-control. Get your act together before the deed, not afterwards. Prove, prove you're a spiritual man. And also avoid all abruptness of manner, cutting people short, simply because, oh, well, you know, 
uh, I'm a little bored by you right now, or I'm very, very busy right now, so I just have to let you feel that I'm busy. No, no, no. That's not meekness of spirit. That's not meekness of heart. Learn to treat within a Christian regard all people who approach you. Be pleasant and affable to all. Be on the outgoing. Show the love of God to men. Show that to them. Demonstrate that. Even if you're tired, especially if you're tired. Don't use tired as I've had such a long day at work. It's been so rough in school. You wouldn't believe all the things I've been through today. Now I have an excuse for yelling at you. No, you don't. No, you don't. Self-mastery. Self-control. This is what meekness is all about. That even if I'm tired, even if this person in front of me bores me right now, I will still practice the pleasantness and affability that I know Jesus would have done. I will be as kind to the poor, the sick, to sinners, to the timid, to the rough, the ignorant, to children, to people who I don't like. In fact, maybe I will be more kind and gentle toward them than I am toward my friends and all those whom I like, simply because... I'm here to live the virtue of meekness, and meekness is found in mastering myself, coming out of myself, to treat with Christian regard everyone who is around me, even those I say I don't like. And lastly, my prayer for you is, if needs be, you must be ready to bear up under the affronts of men. No matter what people will say to you, about you, or no matter what things may come up, that you are ready to bear under it in a Christian manner. Yes, at times it may be necessary to stand up and defend, where necessary, proper um, reputation and things of that nature. We see in the gospel where Jesus defended his apostles. And rough and ignorant as they were, he still stood up for them. He defended his honor before the Sanhedrin when it was necessary for the honor and glory of God and not to stabilize the weak. And yet when other accusations were leveled against him, as being the one who associates with drunk people, carouses around with women, doesn't all these particular, all these accusations, he said nothing. He bore up under it and taught us the example of how we bear the affronts of men. No matter what mean things can be said about us, no matter what they are, the virtue of meekness tells us practice self-mastery, practice self-control. If it means turning the one cheek when struck here, let him strike the other one. Because Jesus says to do so. St. Peter's words in the epistle today, to seek after peace and pursue it, I dare say as a model set before all of us, when considering this point of meekness, but especially here for Father's Day, setting this whole, all of these thoughts here before he in one way, summarize it in one manner. Seek after peace. Make the seeking of Christian peace something that is a part of your life, and not only seeking it and tolerating it, and maybe just in a few areas, but pursue it. Make it a lifelong work, a lifelong goal. Make sure that peace is in your own heart. Peace reigns around you in your homes. Make sure peace is something that is well established. Yes, I know it's difficult. Yes, I know everything is described about here to practice meekness as this virtue in this way as described is hard. But God gives grace to all those no matter how hard it might be to serve and love him as we should. God's grace is always there. All we need to do is ask for it. And so that is a final prayer for you today, that you will ask for this grace. Learn to follow the example of Jesus in meekness and gentleness of spirit. Be this peacemaker that you can be. This is my prayer for you, and I'm conf confident God will give you the graces you need. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.